Okay, so welcome to this next video in which we are discussing the use of the phosphodiesterase inhibitors to treat asthma. Okay, so we've seen that uh, mast cells and bronchial smooth muscle cells have phosphodiesterase 4 enzymes within their cytoplasm. Okay, and if you inhibit this phosphodiesterase 4 enzymes, uh, either with a non-selective phosphodiesterase inhibitor such as theophylline, or with a selective phosphodiesterase 4 inhibitor such as rolopram, roflumilast, uh, silomilast, uh, YM976, and or S. B207499, uh, um, what will happen is that because you're no longer breaking down cyclic AMP, cyclic AMP will go up in the cytoplasm of both the mast cells and the bronchial smooth muscle cells. Now, in the mast cells, this stops uh, the mast cells from being able to release uh, huge amounts of these mediators, which then go on to cause the asthmatic attack. So, if you have been taking the phosphodiesterase inhibitor prophylactically every day, then when you get exposed to the allergen, even though the allergen will bind to the IgE on the surface of the mast cell bound to the FC epsilon R1 receptor, um, it will activate the mast cell, but the mast cell will be stabilized now, and it won't uh, release certainly not as much of the uh, mediators, basically, which will reduce the scale of the asthmatic attack. Because after all, uh, those mediators are what cause the immediate and the late phase of the asthmatic attack. In addition, the cyclic AMP going up in the bronchial smooth muscle cells is going to be pro-relaxant, and it's going to help to keep these bronchial smooth muscle cells relaxed, even when they're being stimulated by histamine and leukotrienes, uh, cystinar leukotrienes. Okay, uh, so we now want to look at why an increase in the cyclic AMP within the cytoplasm of um, the bronchial smooth muscle cells helps to keep them relaxed. Okay, right. So, cyclic AMP is going to activate an enzyme known as the cyclic AMP-dependent protein kinase, okay? And this enzyme is probably more than now famously called uh, protein kinase A. So the cyclic AMP-dependent kinase, which is also now called protein kinase A. Okay, so there are two forms of protein kinase A enzymes. There are type 1 protein kinase A enzymes, and there are also type 2 protein kinase A enzymes. Now, the difference between type 1 and type 2 protein kinase A is that type 2 protein kinase A is going to be bound to certain proteins which are bound to the uh, phospholipid bilayer. Okay, so here is the phospholipid bilayer. There are certain proteins which are bound to the phospholipid bilayer, uh, and which then uh, protein kinase A of the second type, so type 2 protein kinase A, will bind to. Okay, so these proteins that are bound to the inner leaflet of the phospholipid bilayer are known as A caps. Okay, and this stands for A kinase anchoring protein. Okay, so type 2 protein kinase A is going to bind to these A kinase anchoring proteins, whereas type 1 protein kinase A will be free within the cytoplasm of the cell. Okay, now there are a great many A kinase anchoring proteins. There are many A caps, but we'll just keep this general and we'll say that type 2 protein kinase A will bind to an A cap. Okay, so let me now show you the structure of both uh, type 1 and type 2 protein kinase A, and we'll see what the difference between the two is. Why does 1 bind to uh, this A cap and 1 doesn't? Okay, so firstly, uh, protein kinase A is not just one protein. It consists of four proteins that are all bound together. Okay, so here is one of these proteins. Then another identical protein to this one is going to bind to this. Okay, like so. And these two proteins will bind to the A cap. Now, you then also have two final proteins sitting here that are bound to these first two proteins. Okay, so these first two proteins here that we initially drew, these are what are known as the regulatory subunit of protein kinase A. And because uh, these regulatory subunits of protein kinase A are bound to the A caps, 
that implies that they must be the type 2 regulatory subunits. So in protein kinase A type 2, you have type 2 regulatory subunits of protein kinase A. And these type 2 regulatory subunits of protein kinase A, these are going to bind to uh, the A cap, basically. Okay, so let me highlight these type 2 regulatory uh, subunits of protein kinase A in pink, okay? Now, these are often denoted as R2 proteins, okay? So, type 2 regulatory subunit of protein kinase A is often referred to simply as the R2 protein. So, you put two R2 proteins together in a dimer like this, and then you attach on these other two proteins, and these other two proteins are what are known as the catalytic subunits of protein kinase A. So, overall, to make a protein kinase A enzyme, you have to firstly stick together two regulatory subunits of protein kinase A, okay? And if you want to make a type 2 protein kinase A, then you need to make, um, you need to pick two type 2 regulatory subunits of protein kinase A, okay? Then you add on two catalytic subunits of protein kinase A, and the catalytic subunits are not different between type 1 and type 2 protein kinase A. Okay, so let me now show you the structure of a type 1 protein kinase A. So type 1 protein kinase A will be free within the cytoplasm, so it won't be bound to these A kinase anchoring proteins that are bound to the inner leaflet of the phospholipid by there. Instead, it will be free within the cytoplasm. Okay, and the um, type two, 1 protein kinase A will look very similar to the type 2, except that these regulatory subunits here now will not be type 2 regulatory subunits of protein kinase A, but instead will be type 1 regulatory subunits of protein kinase A, which are denoted R1. Okay, but I want to stress these catalytic subunits are identical to the catalytic subunits that you had in the type 2 protein kinase A. So the entire thing up here, now, this entire complex of four separate proteins, this is referred to as type 2 protein kinase A. Okay, whereas this one down here, which is free within the cytoplasm, this entire thing is then referred to as a type 1 protein kinase A. Okay, so this is important to understand. So this is type 1 protein kinase A. So the difference in between type 1 and type 2 protein kinase A is in the regulatory subunit. Now, the regulatory subunit is not the subunit which is actually going to phosphorylate serine and threonine residues on proteins, okay? So, it's the catalytic subunits which can phosphorylate serine and threonine residues on proteins. So, the catalytic subunits are identical between the two different types of protein kinase A. So, as far as that's concerned, they're going to phosphorylate proteins in exactly the same way. They're just located in different positions. Now, when the catalytic subunits are bound to the regulatory subunits like so, here, um, the catalytic subunits are inactive, okay? So they're not active whilst they're bound to these regulatory subunits like this. However, when cyclic AMP goes up, cyclic AMP combines to these little furrows that I've drawn here, okay? Uh, which are cyclic AMP binding sites. And this will cause changes in the structure of the uh, regulatory subunits. So in both cases, in both the case of the type 2 and type 1, uh, regulatory subunits of protein kinase A, when cyclic AMP binds, and two cyclic AMP molecules will bind to each uh, regulatory subunit of protein kinase A to make a total of four cyclic AMP molecules needed to activate the whole protein kinase A enzyme. Okay, so here are the protein kinase A molecules here, which have now just been demoted to being represented as little orange circles. Okay. What it's going to trigger is a change in the conformation of the regulatory subunit of protein kinase A, whether this is a type 1 or a type 2 regulatory subunit. Okay, and when the uh, regulatory subunit changes conformation in this way, what will happen is the catalytic subunits will be released. Okay, 
And now these catalytic subunits are identical, whether we're talking about a type 1 or a type 2 protein kinase A. All that differed between these two types of protein kinase A enzyme was the regulatory subunits. Okay, so now the catalytic subunits are free. And what are these going to do? Well, they're going to um, phosphorylate serine and threonine residues within proteins. So these are serine threonine kinases. So they're going to add phosphate groups onto proteins. Okay, so so far, to summarize the process, when we uh, give the phosphodiesterase 4 inhibitor, uh, whether this is a non-selective or a selective PTE4 inhibitor, cyclic AMP is going to go up within the cytoplasm of the smooth muscle cells. Okay, and this is now going to activate protein kinase A enzymes which are going to release these catalytic subunits. And now these catalytic subunits are going to phosphorylate certain proteins.